Welcome everyone to Maximizing Your HR Impact for Today's Workforce and Current Economy. Thank you all for joining us. Please send questions through the Q&A located on your menu bar. We will try our best to answer all of your questions, but if for whatever reason we're unable to get to your question today, please email learning at nfp.com. Today's presentation is being recorded and we'll be sharing the recording in the coming days. At this time, I'd like to introduce Kayla Bell, Vice President of Sales and Operations at Helios HR, and Amy Dozier, Vice President and Practice Leader of Consulting at Helios HR. Amy, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you, Amber, for the warm introductions, and thank you all for joining us. We are excited to be here today and are going to start our conversation reflecting on the current state of HR, our economy, and the labor trends. And then we will segue to highlight four key workplace trends we are seeing in our client base and talk about how strong HR leaders are responding to those trends. We're going to start off with a bit of a history lesson here. It's taken 120 years to get HR to what it is today, so please bear with me for a moment as, uh, until we get to the fun stuff. At um, Really, at the turn of the 20th century, HR didn't exist. We were employment clerks, really helping frontline supervisors with some very limited day-to-day -day tasks. Then during World War I, there was a huge labor shortage and a high demand for workers. And to combat the supply and demand issues, employers had to start raising wages. By the 20s, personnel administration was born. Then with the Great Depression and New Deal laws, the 30s were about fair pay, workplace safety, and labor unions, which led to the beginning of formalizing hiring processes and employee handbooks. And it wasn't until the 40s that employers started to begin to realize that the importance of treating employees well was, was important. And in late 1948, the American Society of Personnel Administrators, or ASPA, was created. Not until the 50s was the term human resources even introduced, and eventually ASPA changed its name to what we know today as the Society of Human Resources Management, or SHRM. It wasn't until the late 1980s that the term strategic partner and HR were even said in the same sentence. And then it took a worldwide pandemic and the murder of George Floyd resulting in the Black Lives Matter movement for many organizational leaders to turn to their HR teams for guidance on, yes, compliance items, but also how to attract, retain, and engage talented people. So we continue to see the name given to our profession evolve from from uh, per, uh, personnel administration to human resources to human capital to people operations to employee experience officers and everything in between. But regardless of what we're called today, there are still some organizations that view HR as an administrative function and more and more organizations are starting to see HR as a critical piece of its business success. And those leaders and those organizations really truly embrace the statement, our people are our most important asset. And they see HR as a critical link to attracting, engaging, and retaining talent. HR leaders making an impact are those who are approaching their work with a truly strategic mindset. Amy, what does that mean to approach HR with a strategic mindset? We hear so often from leaders that they want a strategic HR leader, but then they focus on tactical items like making sure we're compliant, maintaining a handbook, administering benefits. Yeah, that's a great question. Strategic HR leaders are shaping the company culture, influencing the employee experience, and empowering people leaders across the company to make decisions that align with the values and the desired culture. Those leaders, their help, they, they help create first impressions through recruiting practices to help attract the type of people who can both do the work while also doing it in a way that's aligned with company values. They're listening to employees and managers to identify potential issues and leading initiatives that shape the employee experience and establish cultures of intention. They mitigate risk, risk for the company by staying abreast of the ever-changing federal, state, and local laws. And they're not seen as the HR police, but they help find a path to yes. They're making sure that employee health and well-being are at the forefront of every decision and providing managers with tools and resources to help employees show up as their best selves. They're innovative and using technology to create efficiencies while not losing the human touch. 
They're using metrics and data to inform business decisions and presenting their business case in a way that business leaders will understand. And that's often talking about the bottom line. And they're sitting at the table being a strategic business partner and collaborator with other business leaders across the company, proactively aligning HR practices and programs with the company's overall business strategy and goal. And this is especially important during times of transition and changes like mergers and acquisitions or restructuring. So ultimately, HR leaders have to be informed about the world around them. You have to follow what's going on in the economy and geopolitical landscape and understand the impact that those current events have on your business and the talent you seek to attract and retain today and really in the future. Kayla, can you talk about what's going on in the world now and how that's impacting the labor market? Yeah, it's definitely an exciting time to be in HR, Amy, and there is so much going on that is impacting the market. As you said, HR leaders, it's important to keep a pulse on the economy and labor trends within and outside your business. It's safe to say many of us across multiple industries have felt the economic impact in all aspects of our personal lives and at work. That being said, despite projections and conversations around a potential recession, historically fast tightening of monetary policy, geopolitical crises and uncertainty, the labor market has remained relatively strong throughout the first half of 2024. U.S. employers added over 300,000 new jobs in March, which was 100,000 over projected numbers. We did see considerable slowdowns in April with just 175,000 new jobs created. And those slower than expected gains, and really the lowest since October of last year, came as the Federal Reserve has sought to cool demand to tame high inflation. May numbers have not been released yet, but it will be interesting to watch these numbers as we continue to, through 2024. Another interesting data point, and certainly something to be aware of as HR and recruiting leaders, is that the overall labor force participation rate, defined as the percentage of the population ages 16 to 64 that is either working or looking for work, fell from 67% in 2000 to roughly 62% today. That's a huge drop and definitely should be worrisome for some business leaders. Why such a decline, Kayla, and is it, are, are we expecting that to change? It's projected to remain at this lower level through 2050, and this decline is due to a number of factors. The labor force is aging and retirements are accelerating. This combined with certain populations across the world simply not having children at the same rates as we saw in previous generations. Studies show that by 2050, advanced industrial countries will be losing population at a dramatic rate making living with underpopulation a global phenomenon. By the 2040s, many industrialized nations suffering from declining birth rates will be enticing taxpaying for work, foreign workers to enter their borders. And some like Japan and South Korea have already begun offering foreign workers financial incentives and fast tracks to citizenship. In summary, there aren't enough people to fulfill the labor demand and we don't foresee that changing. Recent years have led to some significant shifts in the labor force. Employees are leaving their full-time jobs and opting for consulting or gig work opportunities as they seek greater flexibility and work-life balance. Social media and other digital earning opportunities provide individuals an avenue to make significant earnings outside of a corporate environment. Employees are seeking and often demanding the opportunity for remote or hybrid work arrangements and are walking away from companies that are requiring that full-time in-person schedule. We see individuals completely shifting from one field to another, no longer following the traditional path of a lifelong career. And we continue to see compensation be a significant driver for accepting, staying in, or walking away from job opportunities. A March report from the Federal Reserve Bank of New York showed an 11.5% increase and in the lowest wage respondents would be willing to accept to take a new job. And that increase was over less than a six month time frame. As employers are managing tighter budgets, we are seeing hiring freezes and reductions in staff occur. If it hasn't happened in your business, your employees are seeing it happen within their personal networks and on social media platforms like LinkedIn. This has resulted in managers and employees alike feeling like they are being squeezed, taking on more job responsibility without an increase in pay. It's leading to burnout and high levels of stress, and employees are disconnecting from the organizational mission and purpose and are losing trust in leadership. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what are employees seeking from their employers to help combat all of these challenges? 
Well, among other things, employees are looking for a well-being approach and total rewards program that caters to their personal needs. Flexible work arrangements and schedules, fair and transparent pay practices, growth opportunity, a respectful work environment where they are recognized for their contributions, and the resources and up-to-date technology to do their job. This aligns exactly with what we're seeing with most of our clients too. The labor shortages and the realities of our post-COVID work environment provide strong talent with more options than ever when it, really, when it comes to work. And I think it's important to note that flexibility means different things to different people. I was talking with a group of parents at my son's soccer game this weekend, and they were saying how tired they were of hoteling. It's designed to support flexibility, but in the eyes of the employees, they're tired of it. They, they said they miss their dedicated workspace. Um, and a couple of weeks ago, I was talking with a leader of an organization about documenting their remote work policy and setting clear guidance and expectations about what flexibility means, not just for the employees, but also so managers could be consistent in how they applied the policy across the company also. Yeah, employees are much more intentionally evaluating the personal return on the investment for the 40 plus hours of their time each week when selecting and staying in jobs. While employees have a baseline salary threshold, studies and surveys show that they're sometimes willing to accept lower salaries for work opportunities that provide them with more flexibility and or will provide the opportunity to strengthen their mental health and feel their overall well-being is not only important to their employer, but nurtured. This requires HR leaders to drive innovative change and ensure HR programs and benefit offerings remain current and attractive to the talent you wish to attract and retain to your business. And as we round out our summary of the current state, we have to take a moment to touch on technology. The pace at which technology is changing the world of work is quite incredible. It took three and a half years for Netflix to reach 1 million user, users, Twitter two years, Facebook 10 months, Instagram two and a half months, and ChatGPT took only five days to reach 1 million users on the platform. That's crazy. It really is. And right now, generative AI is the hot topic in the technology space. We're going to talk a little bit about AI today and what that means for HR leaders. And it's important to remember that AI is one part of the technology landscape. From an HR operations standpoint, technology allows for process automation, process efficiency, and global access. We have HRIS and payroll systems, along with standalone outsourced vendor solutions, such as leave management providers, that provide you with expertise and process, often at a fraction of the investment with lower risk of non-compliance. Employee experience is influenced through social connection, along with the tools and resources provided that allow them to be efficient in their jobs. Social media and the speed at which news, accurate or not, can travel within your business and outside of it has a large influence over your brand reputation in the marketplace, both to your current and potential future employees and your customers and clients. And lastly, AI will transform the way work is performed. While we are still relatively early in the formal adoption of AI in the workplace, it's not going anywhere. Employees are already using it, and it's important that businesses are intentional about embracing and adopting AI. I think that's one of the most important takeaways that we have from everything we're going to talk about today, Kayla. People are using AI, whether we know it or not, and HR has to get on board or risk being left behind. So with all of that in mind, let's talk about what it means for HR leaders today. But before we dive in, uh, we do have a quick poll. Should pop up on the screen here. Um, the question is, what is your organization's biggest people related challenge? Give you a few moment, moments to complete. Don't yeah, see we're not results coming in. Go ahead. I, I can see them, Amy. Um, okay, good. <laughs> yep, and there, there's a good mix. Recruiting for talent, 30%. Employee satisfaction, 20%. Retaining your workforce, 
um, and a little bit across the other the other options as well. And we're really not surprised to see the responses of today's poll. Each of those challenges faced aligned to the four workplace trends we're going to discuss today. Creating stability in the age of uncertainty, adapting to current labor trends in the future of work, accelerating digital transformation and adopting AI, and personalizing the employee experience. As an HR leader, you play an integral part in creating a sense of stability for both the employee population and the business through periods of uncertainty. This year in particular has brought a myriad of challenges that require strategic adaption and resilience. Businesses face pressure to grow, yet have restraints to hire due to market uncertainty and change. As a strategic HR leader, you need to be prepared for whatever threat is around the corner, whether it's cyber attacks, economic downturns, war, environmental events, or even a disruptive new competitor. It's about taking what we've learned from companies that have survived and even thrived in turbulent times and using it to plan and prepare for what might happen tomorrow. HR leaders who have a positive impact on the employee population are adapting their HR and benefit programs to meet employees where they are today. This means fostering a culture that genuinely cares about and provides support to an employee's whole self. Yeah, and we're seeing a lot of our clients take an intentional approach to well-being and formalizing well-being programs within their businesses. We have a whole well-being and engagement team here at NFP, and we, def we define well-being program through four main pillars. It's prevention and physical health, mental health and well-being, financial well-being, and the last one is DEIB or diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, and community. Yes, it is so important to think about how we are supporting employees in each of these four pillars. Employees face stressors, large and small, both at home and at work. A well-being program provides support and resources to employees as they face challenges throughout their day. An even stronger well-being program provides resources which serve to proactively reduce those life stressors in these categories. We just highlighted how employees are feeling higher levels of stress and burnout. Are you combating that challenge with resources for employees to foster stronger mental health and resilience? That's a great question that we should all ask ourselves. Um, and what about employees who are working virtually or in a hybrid environment? How do we help foster a sense of stability for those resources? Employers with remote and hybrid workers must innovate their approach to employee engagement, collaboration, and performance management. HR professionals play a pivotal role in ensuring remote work teams stay connected, productive, and motivated, fostering effective communication in a virtual environment. It also gives employees a sense of belonging, even when they're not physically in the workplace. It's essential to consider the employee perspective in all things that we do as HR leaders and recognize that we have multiple perspectives to consider. Those perspectives may be that of an individual contributor versus a manager, a remote versus an in-person versus a hybrid employee, and employees with varying demographics and backgrounds. Evaluate every communication, every HR program, every policy change. Consider how your various employee profiles are going to be impacted by those messages and changes compared to the benefits and risks of those business decisions to determine the best path forward. There is certainly a correlation to the key metric of retention that is directly associated with your efforts to create stability for the employees. And a key driver of their sense of stability is that they trust the leadership team as being truthful and forthcoming with information that impacts the business and in turn the individual themselves. Yeah, that's so important, that trust piece. We have seen stories in the news and on LinkedIn of layoff meetings being recorded and posted on social media and employees posting about their employers not considering pay increases for seasoned or tenured employees while they've while the employers posted externally a higher pay range for the exact same role. There are TikTok videos um, that go viral and they're making the local and national news now. So it's it's so important. Yes, and these stories spread like wildfire and unfortunately are more likely to reflect a negative interaction than a positive. I recently listened to a podcast and unfortunately the name of it is escaping me, but one of the lines from the message stuck. HR is becoming PR. And in today's world where technology allows for information and misinformation to spread rapidly, business leaders must be intentional about how they are delivering every single communication, business update, policy change, personal performance feedback, or even news of termination to employees. 
HR leaders must put on their public relations hat and partner with business leaders to build intentional communication strategies for all business and HR matters to get ahead of potential crisis communications. Beyond that, the combination of shifts to remote and hybrid workforces and the ever-changing world of legal compliance at both the federal and state level is making it increasingly difficult to stay on top of applicable regulations. To sum it up, HR leaders must demonstrate resilience, reliability, consistency, predictability, and agility to create stability for their employees and the business during periods of uncertainty. Say that time, that say, say that 10 times fast. <laughs> well, I have been practicing. <laughs> I do want to pause for just a moment and highlight agility as one of those key attributes that strategic HR leaders bring to their employers. If your business and HR programs and offerings do not evolve as workplace trends and employee needs evolve, you will find yourself left behind. So how do we cultivate agility as HR leaders? Operate with intention in all of your actions. Have a bias towards action and a progress over perfection mentality. Embrace change. We are going to continue to see HR and the workplace evolve. And promote flexibility with your teams, with your leaders. Be willing to think outside of the way you've always done things and even outside of your industry norms to adapt leading HR practices and programs. Yeah, you just said it, Kayla. Agility is key. So let's talk about what strong HR leaders are doing to adapt to current trends and the future workforce. No matter how hard we may try to fight it, the workplace is changing and employee expectations are evolving. Employees are turning to their employers to provide a whole lot more than a competitive wage and a physically safe work environment that was standard in the 30s. To reiterate how we started our conversation today, we have to adapt to and plan for labor shortages and put the employee experience at the forefront of our decision making process. So on these next two slides, we have provided you with some questions uh, to give some thought to. So let's start with recruiting strategies because these challenges that we've talked about today are no more directly obvious in any other function than recruiting, I think. Um, employees are changing jobs much more frequently. For instance, my dad stayed at the same company for 30 years. My dad too, he was with the government for 30 years, retired from there and continues to work in the same field through a government contractor supporting his original agency. Ironically, Amy, we've both been here for over 10 years. And what's crazy is that today, according to BLS, employees between the ages of 25 to 34 have an average tenure of just over 2.5 years with their employer. And okay, well, maybe we fall a little bit outside of that age range, it is still surprising how short the average tenure data is just a little bit outside of that range. <laughs> um, and yeah, so there's a huge shift in how loyal employees are to their employers. And some employers are embracing that shift in loyalty and making the revolving door a part of their business strategy. So what does that mean to HR? You have to build turnover costs into your budget and you have to have really strong recruiting practices and employer brand that existing employees will be proud to be have been a part of and new candidates are excited to, to learn more about you. Um, most employers, though, are trying to slow the turnover by redesigning the work and implementing strong workplace cultures while also ensuring the candidate experience is positive. Companies who are most successful at finding talent, we find, are those who have worked on their employer brand and implemented recruiting strategies to source and attract that top talent. So ask yourself, how are you finding candidates? Are you posting a job and crossing your fingers that the right candidate will fall into your lap? Or do you have a thoughtful sourcing strategy? Have you gone online with your candidate hat on? What do you see and what do you find out about your company? According to Glassdoor, 86% of employees look at company reviews and ratings before applying to a job, and 86% of women will not apply to a company with a bad reputation. So uh, ask yourself, do you know what your Glassdoor and Indeed ratings are? What do the comments say about the company? And have you posted respon uh, responses to them? Have you tried going through the application process as if you were a candidate? How long did it take? How did you feel? Do you know what barriers exist to the candidates? PeopleHum reported that making job applications mobile friendly will increase applicants by more than 11%. 
It's also our experience that job postings that have the pay ranges posted, whether it's a compliance requirement or not, they attract more candidates. Also the messaging. The messaging from recruiters needs to align with the messaging of the hiring manager or anyone in the in the interview process. And those messages need to align with the company website and the employee, uh, the online employee comments. So you have to prepare your your hiring managers um, and, and ask yourself, are are my hiring managers prepared um, and are the recruiters prepared? Are they is anybody in that process ready to speak to important cultural aspects of the company? Amy, another thing we are seeing is more and more companies testing different and new work models. Mm, yeah, definitely. And this is a, a fun one to talk about. The question I'm being asked very frequently these days by clients is about hybrid, remote, or in-person work. HR has to be at the table for discussions about these flexible work schedules because they could they they really could severely impact their rate of attrition and or level of engagement. I read recently that 32% of workers said that they want to work remotely. And that number goes up if you remove 18 to 25 year olds who prefer to be in the office for their early career experience. Yep. And what was surprising to me, although it sh it really shouldn't have been, um but that according to Harvard Business Review, 60% of workers say that the cost of going to the office outweighs the benefits. So for this reason, employers are starting to look at implementing creative benefits to attract more workers to coming to the office, such as travel subsidies, housing subsidies, caregiver benefits, and financial well-being programs to help employees make the most of their finances and not feel the financial impact of their commute. Separately, as you mentioned earlier, Kayla, we are starting to see a rise in contract work or gig workers. Employees are looking at their workforce and how the work is designed and finding ways to use gig workers in some parts of their company. People are staying in the workforce longer and many are turning to contractor relationships. Uh, so their income stream continues, um, or they just want something to do, uh, but they also like having the flexibility. Like you said, your dad is still working in that part-time capacity. <laughs> and in some, what we're finding too, um, particularly in some of the younger generations are looking for more work-life balance and they're starting to turn to the gig economy, thinking it will bring them more freedom and all around well-being. Many workers have caregiving responsibilities, so not are able, they're not able to take on full-time work. So look for part-time contractor roles. And many are starting to realize that their original career path is not what brings them joy. So they're leaving the workforce and completely starting over in new industries or turning to contract work as well. I do have to put my HR hat on for a moment, Amy, and just say that while more and more individuals are turning to gig work, I want to throw out the disclaimer that with the independent contractor rule, businesses have to make sure you understand the differences between contractors and employees and that you are classifying your jobs and employment relationships in a way that will not open you up to legal risk. Yes, and thank you for mentioning that. So ultimately, as more of the workforce is turning to contract work, we are going to continue to face labor shortages. So begin to evaluate where within your business you can use gig workers. For example, um, we are starting to see um, some organizations use gig workers to um, start to mentor incoming workforce. So as people start to retire, they're staying on as gig workers and they're mentoring and training. So there is a uh, some of that knowledge transfer. And finally, while it's not hugely popular in the US, we are seeing some companies pilot four day work weeks. I know I would appreciate a four day work week. <laughs> I had the opportunity to get lunch with the Washington Business Journal HR Impact Award honorees. And one of them shared how they partnered with their government client and got them to agree to a four day work week schedule, which opened up the candidate pipeline substantially for their business and a work environment where it's really hard to attract talent to come to work in a cleared space that requires full on site presence. And you got to lock your cell phone up for the whole day, no access. Yeah, that's awesome and totally unexpected from a company in that space. I love it. And HR leaders, 
this message is for you. I encourage you to think outside the box. Throw spaghetti against the wall and see what sticks because um, because we got to come up with something. Take some time to think about how you can redefine the work to make the four day work week um, or some other new work model, how you can make it a reality for your company. We have to come to the table with data, propose solutions, work with your finance team to develop cost impact estimates. The investment to make some of these work models a reality may seem daunting, and it could be a huge differentiator for those struggling to find talent. All right, so another way we're seeing clients combat the labor shortages is through upskilling and reskilling. They are literally building the workforce from within. We already talked about how hard it is to find talent and how that's not, not going to get any easier. So why handcuff ourselves by continuing to use the old years of experience and education requirements when what we're really looking for are the skills that we think come with that piece of paper, that diploma, um, when we can hire people what, what are called stars. They're workers who are skilled through alternative routes. Um, so we're looking for the skills, not necessarily that 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 piece of paper, that very expensive piece of paper. <laughs> and in addition, as we educate ourselves on the benefits of having a diverse workforce and uh, the adverse impact that many of our traditional employment policies and practices have had on progress, more and more companies have begun using skills based hiring rather than education and experience. As the world around us evolves, so must the work. As we integrate technology into the white collar work, those jobs will change and the traditional job requirements will also need to change. So rather than turning over the workforce and starting green, we need to start considering now, how might the work change? What skills will our workforce need and how can we start training them today? It's 2024 and according to the World Economic Forum's Future of Jobs report, as companies increasingly adopt more technology, 50% of all employees will need to uh, will need reskilling by 2025. Amy, that's just next year or six months from now. Yes, it is. <laughs> so get ready. <laughs> Um, and companies are, some companies are already starting. They're defining what it means to be successful. They're developing career paths and what skills are necessary to move up. And they're using these defined skills to hire as opposed to the traditional years of experience and education. The most forward thinking companies are building programs to help employees build those skills from within. They're upskilling and reskilling. They're creating opportunities for employees to fill the newly defined roles that require the use of technology, and they're providing employees with more and quicker opportunities for upward mobility. All right, and finally, uh, we have to invest in building our leaders. One, because employees are looking to their leaders to be compassionate and help provide a safe space to work. Uh, just pause for a moment. According to a recent Gartner survey, 57%, 57% of managers say that they are fully responsible for managing and resolving team conflicts. And I can't tell you, Kayla, how many times our team has come to me and said, this situation grew so much bigger than it needed to be and could have been resolved so much more quickly had the manager handled it differently. It seems employee conflicts are going to continue to rise as we face a volatile and divisive geopolitical landscape. People are more and more comfortable talking about their own political beliefs in the office. There are strong conflicting opinions about DEI efforts, labor strikes, et cetera. Yeah, exactly, Kayla. And managers need the tools to shut these conflicts down before they get to a point where teams can't work productively together and ultimately it impacts the business. Secondly, with regards to leaders, um, managers are also being turned to for help navigating their employees' careers more so than any prior generations because the traditional career path is no more. Employees want to move up and they want to move up quickly. We hear that from our clients all the time. So we need to give managers the tools to help them have these conversations with their teams and focus on global skill building rather than traditional path that that manager may have taken themselves. I recently saw a Gartner survey that said only one in four employees feel confident about their current role. 
That's led to 75% of employees browsing new roles at other companies. Only one in four. That's not a lot of people feeling confident. Just it just reiterates this. It makes it this that much more important that we're defining required skills, developing the career paths, giving managers tools to give constructive feedback and help employees in their own professional development. Let's shift the conversation to technology. Advances in technology have substantially influenced the HR profession, how we do our jobs, and the impact we have on the employee experience and access to data. This is only going to continue to evolve and expand as we move forward. Strategic HR teams have been leveraging technology to automate core HR operational processes, such as onboarding and performance management, resulting in reduced errors, easier tracking, enhanced employee and manager experience. They store personnel files digitally, providing easier access for remote teams. They capture, store, and analyze employee data within their HRIS platform. They provide employees with self-service platforms to access important information and communicate changes in personal data to HR directly. And they offer learning and development opportunities for reskilling, upskilling, and general continued learning for their employees. The impact that AI is likely to have on the HR profession is significant, and the reality is that most businesses are lagging when it comes to optimizing the function through the use of technology before we even think about the future of AI. Let me just repeat that sentence for everyone, Kayla. Uh, the reality is most businesses are lagging when it comes to optimizing the function through the use of technology before we even think about the future of AI. We see many organizations and clients struggling to keep up with technology. Many are still paper driven and have very manual processes. And that's okay, it's worked for them to date, but if they don't change soon, they're going to get left behind. And we advise them to take a step back, evaluate how technology advances that are readily available to them today can create efficiency, reduce risk, and really ultimately elevate the overall impact of their function. Yeah, if businesses do not keep up with technology resources, as you said, they run the risk of being quickly left behind as technology continues to propel forward. The transition from a manual and paper-based process to technology-driven processes will become even more cumbersome and challenging. You also run the risk of losing strong talent seeking an employer who remains technologically relevant with the market. So questions to ask yourself include, do you have an HRIS system that houses employee data, automates and streamlines HR operational processes, and overall adds value to your HR operation? Are your personnel files still in paper form? Are your performance evaluation and merit increase cycles managed via manual and paper processes, or are they through an automated platform? Are there redundancies in your operational processes? For example, are you separately entering employee data into five separate systems as part of your onboarding process? And is there a high volume of administrative tasks that you could outsource to a third party who partners their technology with the resource to create efficiency and reduce risk? For example, a third party leave administration provider. According to a recent SHRM report, 20% of HR professionals said integrating AI in the workplace is a high priority in 2024. My initial reaction to that, Kayla, is that 20% feels like a really low number. So why is AI such a big topic if only 20% of HR leaders are even prioritizing it? That's a really great question. And it goes back to what we talked about earlier and the speed at which generative AI tools are being accessed and adopted. We also have to consider that while it might not be a high priority for certain HR leaders compared to their other HR initiatives, they are likely embracing technology and AI throughout their function, even if they haven't categorized it as a high priority for 2024. There are many benefits to bringing AI tools and systems into your organization. Really, at this point, if you're not starting to research and implement this type of technology, you're likely behind your competitors. And I would bet many of your employees are already using AI, whether personally or professionally. Think ChatGPT. Folks are leaning on it to help them quickly generate outlines and ideas for content or generate a packing list for their next vacation. So let's talk through some examples of how AI can benefit your organization. And let's face it, HR teams love a good spreadsheet, but quickly, but trying to sift 
through data and pull together meaningful reports can be administratively burdensome. AI can be used to analyze large data sets quickly, which can provide valuable insights to help inform strategic decisions. This includes data on employee performance, turnover rates, engagement levels, and more. And similarly, AI can predict future HR-related trends and issues based on data, such as turnover risk, skills gaps, and workforce planning. AI can look at position descriptions, training history, certifications, career goals, and other data to create individualized career tracks for employees. We can save a lot of time by leveraging AI to help generate content and ideas, take meeting minutes, draft standard operating procedures, and more, leading to greater productivity and efficiency in teams across the organization. And just as a reminder, there's a lot of uncertainty and honestly a little bit of fear associated with the use of AI tools and systems. And the organizations who work to get this right will use AI as an enhancement to their teams, not a replacement. So clearly there's a lot of possibility with AI, but how are we really seeing AI being used in HR and recruiting today? Great question. A lot of the systems we use daily leverage AI technology already. A short list include ChatGPT, ADP, Bamboo HR, Breezy HR, Grammarly, LinkedIn, Indeed, Bing, Google, Namely, Gusto, Workday, Cornerstone, iSims, Jobvite. I could go on. <laughs> I thought you said it was a short list. Well, I, I do think it's growing every day, and AI has already been integrated into many HRES and ATS systems, and these providers will continue to adapt their technology capabilities with AI. Yeah, we've had colleagues use AI tools like Secta and Aragon to generate professional headshots. I've also had colleagues use Grammarly, for example, to help create grammatically correct and naturally sounding job descriptions. Pillar is another great tool. Uh, that we've heard people using, which is an interviewing platform and has the ability to take interview notes and section off portions of interview videos that you can share with hiring managers. There are many tools and platforms available to you today, and the use of AI will allow your teams to create efficiency. Recruiters can use tools like ChatGBT to generate precise Boolean search queries. By doing this, recruiters can refine search parameters and uncover candidates who closely match desired skill sets and qualifications. And as you continue to find common terms, alternate job titles, or technology used for the role, you can continue to refine the search string to help locate additional candidates. We know that crafting compelling and accurate job descriptions is essential for attracting the right candidates and for managing employee performance. AI tools can enhance this process by analyzing existing job postings, identifying common keywords and phrases, and providing recommendations for optimization. You can also improve the employee experience with AI. Chatbots and virtual assistants can be leveraged to respond to basic or routine HR questions, which provide employees with instant response and free up your HR team to focus on more strategic tasks. AI can help launch employee engagement campaigns or assist with strategies to improve employee engagement based on compiled feedback from the employees. It can evaluate individual employee preferences and help provide a more personalized experience for your employees. You can leverage AI to improve onboarding by developing seamless and personalized onboarding processes for your new hires. For example, AI can automatically create and send messages to employees based on different phases of their onboarding, whether the intent is to keep them engaged or move them along in the process and they can tailor that onboarding experience based on the individual's role and preferences. You can lean on it to recommend personalized learning and development opportunities based on skills, performance, and career goals. And all of this enables HR teams and managers to create per tailored professional development plans that align with both individual and organizational objectives. It's so interesting how far technology has come and scary um, to know how we can use these automated, artificially intelligent tools to create such a personalized experience for our employees and candidates. It really is fascinating, Amy. Um, and, and just another thing is compliance, right? Compliance is another way we can leverage AI. In a never evolving landscape, we all know how challenging it can be to keep up with federal, state, and local laws, especially for, especially for employers continuously adding employees in new locations. Leveraging AI to provide quick information about legislation or obtain a draft policy that you can tailor to your company can be a great help. 
And it's important to note that some content, for example, content gained through ChatGPT may be outdated. So we really recommend leaning on a search engine for compliance matters like Google Gemini or Microsoft Copilot, as they will be able to provide more up-to-date information. Did you know the last time we checked that ChatGPT's information was at last updated in 2022? So thinking about compliance alone, so much has changed since then. You're right, and this is a risk. Unless you are a ChatGPT Plus subscriber and have made some changes within the application setting, to have it browse using the Microsoft Bing search engine. AI can be used for data analysis and to support strategic initiatives within HR functions. The tool can look at data received from employee feedback surveys, exit interviews, and other general HR data to analyze the information and create a meaningful story or report. It can help HR teams analyze comp data to ensure competitive pay and benefits packages. This certainly won't replace the need for salary surveys, but it could help you look at your existing data and identify gaps internally where adjustments may need to be made to stay competitive. Additionally, AI can help forecast staffing needs and plan for future workforce requirements. It can factor in variables like growth projections, turnover rates, and skills gaps to help your organization develop strategic staffing plans. And it can also help identify HIPO employees and potential successors for roles that are critical to the organization. A lot of these processes, Kayla, though they're in-depth processes that require more thought and effort to develop than what AI alone can provide. So I really think it's important to pause and, and remind everybody that more robust projects like compensation projects and career pathing, they require a human oversight and thought, as does rolling out a new policy that maybe AI helped draft for you. Just because it worked for another company or some blogger wrote about it, it doesn't mean that it's gonna work for your company. So as HR professionals, we need to balance leveraging data while maintaining that human touch. Although the influx of technology has given HR departments tools to make data-driven decisions, maintaining a human element with your HR practices is such a new, is, is, is such a new challenge and Automated technology can be great for streamlining, but at the same time, HR professionals have to balance it with a human touch for the sake of the organizational health. I couldn't agree more, Amy, and that's a great segue to our next slide. As Amy just said, it is important to recognize that our role as HR leaders will always need a human element. Our jobs cannot be replaced. AI and technology should be used to help you be successful and more efficient at your job. While AI can streamline certain HR processes, it is essential to maintain human interaction, especially in sensitive areas like employee grievance, conflict, and career development discussions. AI lacks contextual understanding and struggles to grasp nuanced situations or complex interpersonal dynamics making it unsuitable for tasks that require empathy, intuition, or subjective judgment. Even something as simple as the messages AI can automate for recruiters to send should be reviewed to ensure your message is in your voice and personalized when necessary for each candidate. Relying solely on AI for decision-making in HR can perpetuate biases present in historical data or algorithms. This can lead to unfair treatment of candidates or employees. Human oversight is crucial to ensure fairness and equity. I want to test your relationship. As a best practice, organizations utilizing AI should ensure accuracy of data. AI algorithms may mis misinterpret data or make erroneous conclusions, especially when faced with incomplete or biased data sets. Believe it or not, generative AI can be prone to hallucinations, meaning it can generate information that is completely false. So human intervention is necessary to validate AI-generated insights and help prevent misinterpretation. As a quick example, two New York attorneys used ChatGPT to write a legal brief because they were having trouble locating a relevant case to include in the briefing. When they used ChatGPT to assist, it produced a text that was convincing but not accurate. And the brief included six fictitious court case citations. That information was not fact-checked and it was submitted, and those lawyers ultimately faced sanctions due to their submission of invalid information. 
that when you told me that Kayla, like that's just a crazy story for one. <laughs> But also, it's a huge risk for businesses who are not aware of how employees are leveraging AI and not putting parameters in place for how to use AI in the workplace. Absolutely. While AI brings many benefits to the workplace, it also brings its fair share of risk. For example, AI systems that collect and analyze employee data also raise data privacy concerns, particularly regarding sensitive information such as health records or personal preferences. HR should prioritize data protection and transparency in the use of AI. Employers should also place guardrails on what can be uploaded to open source AI platforms. Generative AI uses inputs to create outputs, and your inputs become part of the AI database that generates those outputs for anybody else accessing that same AI tool. So caution should be used when adding data to these generative AI tools. With these significant risks in play, you have to protect your business. If your IT department is leading the charge on all things AI, we encourage you to collaborate with them and think about what the employee experience is and the impact of AI in the workplace. To help mitigate risk, make sure you understand legal and regulatory frameworks when implementing the use of AI tools and systems by assessing compliance with applicable existing laws, making necessary investments to ensure compliance, and being familiar with data protection protection, anti-discrimination, and other such employment regulations. As a just quick example here, New York recently passed legislation requiring employers to disclose the use of AI tools in the hiring process to candidates. The intent of the policy is to ensure that job applicants are informed on how technology has influenced the hiring process and employment decisions of the business. That's a great example, and I imagine we will continue to see more and more legislation around AI, both at the federal and state level. It's also critical to prioritize data privacy and security. Ensure any data added to AI systems and tools is protected, prevent employees from uploading any proprietary or confidential information or company trade secrets, and review up and update any privacy disclosures. Be transparent with respect to collection, storage, and usage of that data. You want to make sure you have processes to identify, document, assess, and monitor risks in the use of AI. Have a plan in place to monitor and test AI for risks related to accuracy, integrity, and quality of the outputs. Continuously monitor algorithms for bias and discrimination. Ensure human oversight is maintained and use AI as an enhancement rather than a replacement, especially in critical decision making. Additionally, it's important to confirm the AI models you are using are trained on diverse and representative data sets to prevent bias and regularly conduct audits against that. When selecting an AI vendor, make sure the vendor practices are properly vetted and don't be afraid to ask them about their data protection and their algorithm policies and practices. Also, once you've made a decision on an AI vendor, we certainly recommend starting with a pilot program before you fully deploy that tool or system. And last, but certainly not least, provide user training Let's be honest, change is hard and AI can be a little intimidating. So make sure you educate users on appropriate use of AI, the limitations of AI, and the importance of ethical and unbiased decision making. And beyond the compliance training, if your business is adopting AI technology that will create efficiency for your workers, make sure they know how to leverage the resource and aren't expected to figure out how to use it on their own. So with all of these risks and best practices, are we seeing formal AI policies actually being adopted? Absolutely. If you don't have an AI policy in place, we strongly encourage you to develop one. We have uh, our next slide here highlights the steps in writing an AI policy. For the sake of time, I'm going to we're going to skip to the next slide, but in our recap, we'll we'll give you a little context around the steps to writing an AI policy because it certainly is a complicated policy to put in place for your organization. Do one quick poll, um, which do you currently have a AI policy in place? So give you just one quick moment. And as you're responding and looking at the responses, a metric is that 75% of organizations do not have one in place. So you're not behind if you haven't done this, and um, hopefully you've, you've gained some insight and resources today that can help you put a policy in place moving forward. 
So we want to wrap up our conversation just highlighting the importance of personalizing the employee experience. As we've said over and over again today, the talent market is tough and we need to prepare ourselves for this difficulty in finding talent to continue. Our workforce is more diverse and as a society, we're beginning to understand how different our individual needs are. We can no longer rely on a one size fits all total rewards package and we have to offer choice and employees are expecting choice. What does it mean to personalize the employee experience, Amy? When you say that, I think about how social media personalizes their advertisements to my preferences. Is it similar for businesses and their total rewards programs? Essentially, yeah. It's about offering options across the board that cater to varying employee profiles and needs. So as examples, more organizations are giving employees multiple medical plans from which to choose. Some prefer to pay higher premiums so they don't have to worry about out-of-pocket costs, while others are not in a position to pay high premiums and want a cheaper option. When we think about leave programs, we have more clients considering transitioning to a flexible leave model, giving employees ultimate uh, flexibility in how and when they use their time. We have more employees are using their days off for mental wellness. And the traditional holiday schedule doesn't typically account for other religions, giving flexibility allows employees to use those days to celebrate and observe the holidays that are meaningful to them. With another colleague this year, I led another webinar about our leave management survey. We talked a lot about bereavement leave, for example, and how long it takes somebody to be able to return to work after losing a loved one is going to vary from person to person. Um, so we have to flex to give to give those individuals the time that they need to be able to come back and be productive. Some other leave programs that we're seeing we've with more older women in the workforce today, many organizations are starting to implement menopause leave. And again, with people staying in the workforce is longer, many employees are becoming grandparents, so we've seen grandparental leave. Um, performance management, um, it can no longer be just a once a year check in the box. We have to cater to the employee. They want feedback. How quickly are we giving them feedback? How often are we giving them feedback? That may have to be a personalized experience as well. We talked about um, career pathing and employees aren't taking the, you know, a traditional career path anymore. So we have to talk to them, be able to talk to employees about um, how to how to get to their ultimate career goals and um, being able to help them develop those skills. There's so many different different aspects within the HR function and the programs that we build um, rewards and recognition. We talked about work model flexibility earlier, um, so it, it really touches every program uh, that that we build. So we want to just wrap up with some key takeaways as we bring it all together. We want to leave you with a to do list. Um, so you as an HR leader can maximize your impact for 2024 and beyond. Follow the news as it relates to the economy, worker expectations and geopolitical events. Develop communication plans that promote business stability and give employees confidence in you as leaders. Identify barriers to attracting and retaining talent and find creative ways to remove those barriers. Explore how you can optimize HR operations by embracing technology in a way that doesn't lose the human touch. Partner with leaders across the company to redefine jobs for the age of technology. Identify skills gaps and develop a workforce plan. And finally, personalize the employee experience. Provide options, create flexibility, and don't ever underestimate the power of the overall people experience. I think that is all that we have time for today. So um, thank you for submitting your questions. Um, we didn't have time to get to them, but we will do our best to respond to those as part of our follow-up communication from this webinar. All righty, well, thank you, Amy and Kayla for sharing your valuable time and expertise with us today. To reiterate, today's presentation was recorded and we will be sharing the recording in the coming days. There is a link in the chat to a survey. I'm about to send it. Um, please take a brief moment to complete the survey because it lets us know what topics are important to our listeners and helps keep our education program as current and relevant as possible. 
Let me just go ahead and drop that in the chat real quick for you. And there it is. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us and have a great day.